thank you all for, for coming this evening. And uh, I, uh, I hope you uh, are going to learn something. This was a great project for me to, to learn a lot about um, Jefferson City's history. Working for the newspaper for several years, I learned bits and pieces. But doing this research project helped put kind of the, the, the sinew and everything together um, about it. Um, as I say in the book, though, I want to clarify that this is not intended to be a comprehensive history of the city or in any way grab the entire country. I'm just telling the interesting stories, hoping maybe grab a few things that a lot of you are pretty noted historians yourself. Maybe uh, a couple of things in here you, you didn't know already. And, um, Maybe we'll, we'll learn together here. Um, so I wanted to, to start out and um, tell you a little bit about me. I love origin stories. So anything that's the first generation, anything that's how did they come up with that in the first place? Or why did they leave what they knew and go to something that they didn't understand or didn't under, you know, know? Uh, those things have always just fascinated me. So um, this is really fun to, to kind of dig into to Jefferson City's origins and those first people who came to a, to a wilderness, to a place where a city was going to be but wasn't there yet. Uh, just very fascinating. This uh, book is actually uh, kind of a, uh, a fluke, if you will. Um, I had contacted the publisher about um, the uh, research that I'm doing on the Tuskegee Airmen uh, who attended Lincoln University. And um, they said, well, that might, not, that might not fit our audience, but we're looking for somebody to do this book. So and I'm like, oh, okay. So I kind of set my other project aside to, to do this. But um, I hope you enjoy it because I really enjoyed uh, researching it and um, it's really fun to, to kind of have it out here and, and to get to share with you all. So up here, I just wanted to uh, give a little credit to um, all the, the sources that I was able to, to uh, use in just this first section of the book on the, the earliest origins. And um, as you can see, the, several of the primary sources up there came from the Missouri State Library. And those are available to the public. You guys are welcome to come in and, and take a look. In fact, we have um, one of the uh, original uh, papers from the, the permanent seat of government up there. It's out in a display case in the lobby. So before you leave, I encourage you to, to go over there and, and take a look and, and see the, the original documents. That, that's what the archive's for, to, to hold those and preserve those, but also for you to come and look at them for yourself. Um, as uh, John Dugan mentioned earlier, um, you can actually, if you own a property within the original city limits of the city, you can come look at the seat of government records and you can find out information about your home, your property with, within that area. So that's just really fun to just be able to connect with the um, properties in that, in that way using the, the original documents. And I want to... Uh, say a personal thank you to the, the local historians who let me pick their brains and, and uh, they, they'd already done the research so it was nice to, to just be able to, to hear from them about what they learned. And um, there at the, the bottom, the, the Cole County Historic Society and St. Peter's Church, uh, great resources. So I encourage you if you're doing any kind of research projects um, to consider them as well. Um, you might be able to, to find some documents you didn't know existed uh, at those places as well. So as Vicki said, the uh, Jefferson City's existence is owed entirely to a state commission that was formed uh, to select what became or what was an unclaimed forested hill of limestone on the south bank of the Missouri River. Now like all of Missouri, it passed from Spanish to French hands and then to the United States and the Louisiana Purchase. And as the Missouri Territory, it was part of St. Louis County. And then when Howard County was created in 1815, it was part of that. Then it was part of Cooper County when it split in 1818. And then Cole County finally became its own in 1820. Now there were only two settlements 
on the Missouri River within 20 miles either side of the o mouth of the Osage at the time of the selection. And that's kind of key because um, the uh, legislature had set, had set that as their parameters. They, they had a certain amount of acreage that they needed and then they wanted it within 20 miles either side of the mouth of the Osage. And um, there's Coat Sanderson, which is on the, the north side, sorry, north side of the uh, river on the Callaway County side. And uh, then there was Marion that was um, on the, the west side of, of what became Jefferson City. And um, just to, to remind you, the river was the main transportation artery at the time. That's why the, the uh, confluence of the Osage and Missouri was such a key uh, point in their designation. So Marion was formed by pioneers from Tennessee as early as 1860, and their eagerness to host the future capital is apparent by the residents' um, eagerness to, to donate land, but flooding and boat access were issues to be considered. But Coates Anderson, that was the prime contender. It was a French village, and Coates Anderson is uh, French for Hill Without Design. Um, trappers and fur traders were working out of that spot uh, nearly as soon as Lewis and Clark passed by, and a village formed in 1808. It was the site of the furthest west War of 1812 battle in May of 1815. In 1820, it had about 100 souls and was the largest population center within that 40-mile range of the Osage River. Now, Jonathan Rains, he's going to pop up throughout the evening here, so remember his name. He was one of the most prominent men uh, in the area, and he lived at Coates Anderson. He was Brigadier General of the Territorial Militia, and he was the state representative in 1820. So while they were meeting in St. Charles, uh, he, he's kind of attributed with being the, the one to put that uh, parameters in for being within 20 miles, because then it didn't go all the way to Franklin, which was one of the, the larger uh, settlements um, out this far. So um, Jonathan Ramsey was really uh, pushing for Cope Sanderson to, to be the, the capital, and um, many legislators considered Cope Sanderson a done deal as well. But land speculators and misused New Madrid earthquake land replacement certificates foiled the site's obvious selection. And so, a site avoided by the state's earliest pioneers who preferred the river bottoms and the richer soil of the North Bank was selected. The forested limestone cliffs up to that time were primarily used by the Mississippian people for mound burials stretching from Richmond Hill to Capitol Hill and to Osage City. Now, here's one of my favorite guys. His name is William Jones. And as far as I can tell, he was the earliest settler here. Um, he uh, had a, a shanty that he used as a tavern that um, I, I'm assuming that the lot that he eventually bought when state lots were actually plotted and sold is the same location. It would be on the end of Harrison Street, which is actually just at this door and down this way. So we're, we're almost there, if he was still here. But um, he, uh, had, he was here before 1819, and uh, a visitor to his um, uh, tavern about that time I remembered paying a silver quarter cut from a Mexican dollar for a half pint of liquor. So William Jones was a Revolutionary War veteran, and you will find that there were a lot of Revolutionary War veterans and War of 1812 veterans. Who, who came out this way. Uh, William Jones joined the Patriot cause in Virginia during a draft for young men, and he helped build huts in the six inch snow at Valley Forge, and then he crossed the Potomac River to fight at the Battle of Monmouth. In Cole County, he was one of the first to receive a ferry license in Jefferson Township. He was one of the first justices of the peace in Jefferson City, and he was an original city trustee when it was incorporated November 7, 1825. He moved to Roachport in 1829 when his son Robert Jones took over the tavern. Robert Jones was equally involved in the community and served six years as city, city collector before he moved to Texas. Now Robert Jones married Mariah Ramsey. If you remember Jonathan Ramsey, that's her dad. So you've got these, these uh, two families uh, joining forces. 
Mariah's uh, brother, Josiah Jr., wound up coming um, and being the second person to live here in what became Jefferson City. And they were the only two families living here <coughs> at the time of the sale of the first lots in 1823. <coughs> Okay, so this is this map is fun. Um, so I tried to kind of sh uh, show where the original um, plat for the city uh, ended, um, and then um, we'll get closer uh, to the the marked off places a little later. Um, those show where the first lots were actually um, sold. But um, I wanted to, to introduce you to the, the five commissioners um, who the General Assembly appointed to make the selection of who became Jefferson City. And um, they were from Howard County, New Madrid County, Pike County, and Wayne County. And then we had Daniel Morgan Boone, who replaced his slave brother, Jesse Bryan, Bryan Boone from Montgomery County. So in December 1821, these commissioners gave their final approval for the bleak site that became the future capital city. The site met the required 2,560 acres in four sections of unclaimed public land. And the commission described the land as too poor to support any considerable population or extensive settlement. So soon, soon after that, um, Elias Barcroft and his wife's uncle, Daniel Morgan Boone, who had served on the commission, laid out 1,000 one half acre in lots and five 40 acre out lots. So I thought it would be fun to just kind of pull together um, the, some of the Boone connections, and I'm sure this may not be all of the Boone connections to Jefferson City, but these are the ones that I came across um, for this book. Um, so a little background, Squire Boone arrived in America at age 21 with the Society of Friends, or the Quakers. He immigrated from Devon, England to Pennsylvania and then to North Carolina, where he married Sarah Morgan. One of their sons is the noted frontiersman Daniel Boone, who moved from North Carolina to Kentucky in 1770. Third generation Daniel Morgan Boone and several of his brothers, including Jesse Bryan Boone, were among the first to receive land grants west of the Mississippi River in the future Missouri Territory. Now they created a, a salt making operation near Boonville in 1805 and that is where he was when he came here as part of the commission and then helped survey for the lots. Um, Daniel Morgan Boone later moved to Jackson County and then for nearly a decade was in Kansas teaching farming to Native Americans. Now, some sources suggest that Margaret Vance, who is the wife of Elias Barcroft, was a niece of Daniel Morgan Boone. That needs more research. But we'll talk about it anyway, because he's a pretty neat guy. A New Jersey native, Barcroft had been surveying land as early as 1808 in Ohio and then Illinois, and had been appointed deputy surveyor of the Missouri Territory in 1813. He was responsible for surveying the fifth principal meridian, which served as the baseline for future surveys of two million acres of land in the Louisiana to purchase. In 1822, when he conducted the survey of Jefferson City, Barcroft was a senator from Howard and Cooper counties. In 1823, he began 10 years of service as the state auditor. He was among the, five city, the first five city trustees when Jefferson City was incorporated and he served as a commissioner of school lands and also a commissioner on the first county jail constructed in Jefferson City. After his death of cholera in 1851, the Barcroft home at the southeast corner of Maine and Madison, where the parking garage is today, uh, was used as the post office. <laughs> now Barcroft was joined in the state auditor's office in St. Charles in 1823 by his brother-in-law, Hiram Baber. When the state government relocated to Jefferson City in 1826, Faber and Barcroft carried the state archives by canoe along the Missouri River. Faber later also served as state auditor for eight years. Born in Virginia and reared in Kentucky, Faber arrived in St. Charles County where he met and married Harriet, the daughter of Jesse Bryan Boone. He served in the state's first constitutional convention in June 1820 in St. Louis. Apparently, he was quite a character. He was described as a reckless, fun-loving sort of man. He built a brick home, carving root hog or die above his front door. <coughs> he lit his pipe with bank bills 
to show how easily he could make money and how little he cared for it. He was involved in the ginseng and pine trade through his store in St. Charles, and when he came to Jefferson City, he, he recorded the first census in 1830, when we had 470 families and a population of 3,000. And then there's Wincoop Warner. Harriet Boone Baber's sister Minerva married Wincoop Warner, who was born in Virginia to Quakers and then moved to Ohio. He served three years during the War of 1812, eventually being promoted to captain in the 19th Infantry by General Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Minerva's grandfather, Daniel Boone, lived his last years with the Warners, who employed someone to take him hunting. And their oldest son, Theodore, he hid his apples and nuts in his great-grandfather's future coffin, which the elder kept under his bed. All right. Now we're going to get to the fun stuff. All right. So the General Assembly designated May 1823 for the sale of 200 lots, which were to fund the State House construction. But the day only generated about $6,500, or about one-fourth of the money they needed for the building costs. So to oversee the sale of these lots, they appointed three men, Josiah Ramsey, Jr. Remember Mr. Ramsey, this is his son, and he was the, the second to settle in the Jefferson City area. The second trustee was John C. Gordon, Jr. We'll talk more about him, but he was the first hotel uh, owner, built the Rising Sun Inn across the street uh, from the State House. And the third was Adam Hope, who was a Callaway County attorney. So then Duff Green was paid $16 for publishing the sale of lots, and Wooden Coop Warner served as the auctioneer. <coughs> Jesse Royston received $18 for serving the trustees as clerk. Royston was another War of 1812 veteran. He waited 14 years for Congress to reimburse him $80 for a horse he had lost while in service with the Mounted Kentucky Volunteers. When Jefferson City was incorporated in 1825, Royston was another one of those original city trustees. Now, another one of my favorites, Jane Ramsey Ewing. Guess who her dad was? So, essential to the sale of lots was a plat map. So Jane Ramsey Ewing painted the original city plat map, which was lost in the first state house fire in 1837. On a white canvas stretched across a 20 foot by 30 foot wooden frame, she painted Broadway red and all the other north and south streets green, the cross streets blue, and 200 lot numbers in black. But she was only paid $10, and at the time was also caring for her first child, Missouri Jane Ewing. Now remember Missouri Jane, because she'll come up again too. As a teenager, Jane Ramsey Ewing moved about 1817 from Kentucky to Callaway County, where she married lawyer Robert Allen Ewing, another War of 1812 veteran. She was remembered as one of our most distinguished and esteemable ladies. Her husband served as Cole County Judge, and their two sons each served in the state legislature. So, May 5th, 1823, Jane Ramsey Ewing's giant map is set up on a cleared space which become Broadway. During the sale, Mrs. Ewing stood alongside her creation with a long pointer indicating each lot as it was called by auctioneer Wincoop Warner, who happened to be Callaway County Sheriff at the time. And Jesse Royston was there beside them to record the sales. In all, 60 investors bought the first 200 lots that day in May 1823. The average price paid $32. The purchaser only needed to pay one third of his bid. They could pay the next year in installments. So trustee John C. Gordon Jr. bought 19 lots that day. Many of them were on valuable corner lots. That included the, the site of his future tavern and inn, The Rising Sun. He was the son of a Revolutionary War veteran who settled in Coates and Descent. When the county government moved to Jefferson City in 1829, its first meeting was held in Gordon's house, where Bishop Funeral Home is today. And until the new county courthouse was built in Jefferson City, the government rented space for a clerk's office out of his home. Trustee Josiah Ramsey Jr. bought 10 lots, mostly in the 200 and 300 blocks of East High Street, plus a couple choice corners in the future Milbotham area. And Jonathan Ramsey, well, he bought 15 lots himself. 
Trustee Adam Hope bought only one lot, the northwest corner of Jefferson and High, where Thomas Lawson Price would build the Virginia Hotel, later known as the Central Hotel. Robert and Jane Ramsey Ewing, they bought the northwest corner of Madison and High, where the city hotel stood before today's Central Trust building. First resident William Jones, he bought only one lot at the southeast corner of Harrison and Water Street, where he continued to operate his tavern. Right, right here. The most lots were purchased by Boone County merchant Peter Bass. He bought 23. Born in Maryland, Bass lived in Nashville, Tennessee, before moving his family to Boone County in 1819. The Peter Bass Plantation, 10 miles southeast of Columbia, may best be remembered as the place where African-American horse trainer Tom Bass learned his trade. Alfred Basie, a state representative from Howard County, bought 15 lots and moved his family to Jefferson City. He eventually bought the entire 400 block of East Capitol Avenue where he built the first brick house in the city. Basie later bought 16 lots from Peter Bass and he once owned all of College Hill, today known as Richmond Hill. He was a cousin to two presidents and served as a postmaster for a time. And then he later bought the Raisin Sun Inn from Mr. Gordon. Christopher Casey, another Revolutionary War veteran, and the namesake of the local Sons of the American Revolution chapter, bought all four lots on the north side of the 300 block of Miller Street, about where the Simonson practice field is today. And as just an aside, I share, whoo, sorry, I share a common ancestor with Christopher Casey, so that was kind of uh, fun to track that down. And Daniel Colgan Jr. opened the first general store in Jefferson City not long after this sale. He bought only one lot, or he bought one lot on the south side of East Main, where the first Presbyterian church was built. And he bought one lot on the northeast corner of Harrison at Main Street. Colgan had opened the first general store in Coat Sanderson in 1822 with his father, who had been a tailor and former justice in St. Charles. Colgan moved to the future Jefferson City site by November 1823, when Jefferson Township was established after a meeting held at his house. Now, the brothers, McDaniel and Stephen Doris, each bought two lots all on Water Street. Their father, an Irish minister, had been integral to the formation of the Baptist Cumberland Association in Tennessee. The Doris brothers moved in 1818 from Tennessee to Callaway County, where Stephen, a doctor, served as a county court justice before moving to Polk County. Dr. Stephen Doris began as a surgeon's mate in the Kentucky militia during the War of 1812. A town proverb in the mid-19th century, keep a trotten, was attributed to Dr. Doris. The story goes that in treating a patient in the last stages of consumption, Dr. Doris asked him, when did you felt the most relief? And the patient replied, when he rode a hard-trotting horse. So Dr. Doris' advice, keep a trotten. <laughs> now, McDaniel Doris brought the Irish tradition of whiskey making. He was the younger brother and set up the city's first distillery on Water Street, uh, best I can tell, um, oh, that's fine. Um, it was uh, toward the end of Broadway Street on Water Street. His product was described as clear and sparkling like spring water with a potent quality that caused those who drank it to fight snakes where others could see no snakes. <laughs> he also made peach brandy and apple jack. He would say his whiskey was as innocent as the same quantity of buttermilk. It was also said, if a man got drunk on it, it took a week to get him sober again. <laughs> McDaniel Doris was described as having the most happy disposition, always rendering him contented with himself and the world, and thus no doubt greatly contributing to prolonged life. He was distinguished for an uprightness and honesty which never suffered the slightest taint of blemish. McDaniel Doris and Hiram Baber were the longest living of the original Jefferson City from 1826. With the revenue of the sale of the first lots in May 1823, the General Assembly in February 1825 awarded the contract to construct the first state house to Coat Sanderson entrepreneur Daniel Hogan Jr. However, it was James Donica who actually completed the contract. Much of the city's early architecture can be attributed to Donica, including the first Polk County Courthouse on the same side as today's courthouse, and the first county jail at the southeast corner of Monroe and McCarty Streets. He also supervised the first construction at the Missouri State Penitentiary. 
Born in Kentucky, Dunico was a tanner, shipping first to St. Louis from Coates Sanderson when the capital opportunity arrived. And he was a charter member and the first Grand Master of the Masons. The first state house was two-story, 60 feet by 40 feet brick. It had a rock foundation and eight fireplaces. It was built facing the Missouri River in the 100 block of Madison Street, where today's executive mansion is. The Fourth General Assembly met for the first time in Jefferson City with 38 representatives and 14 senators on November 20, 1826. One half of the State House was used for senators on the first floor and representatives above. The other half served as the governor's residence. Bachelor John Miller was the first governor to take up the residence. A War of 1812 veteran from Howard County, Miller was elected in a special election in 1825. Governor Frederick Bates had died in office in August just after Lieutenant Governor Benjamin Reeves had resigned. So records show 30 households called Jefferson City home when the legislature arrived. In addition to the named men, they represented at least 50 women and children and an unknown number of enslaved people. Half of those heads of households in 1826 were involved in the state house construction. Many moved on after the project completed. But a few stayed, like Carpenter Terry Skirloff, who had served in the Tennessee militia during the War of 1812 and then signed up for another five years with the U.S. Rifle. And Carpenter Azariah Kennedy, who built a steam mill at the north end of Monroe Street before the railroad depot. Then there's Brick Mason Reuben Garnett, who built several early buildings, including the longtime newspaper office at the northeast corner of Madison Street and Capitol Avenue. And then there's David Scribner, who bought 240 acres of land near Russellville in 1831 and became one of the charter members of Cold Spring Baptist Church, one of the oldest churches in the county. So if you're back to the, scoot, uh, back to the future fan, um, please uh, forgive the crudity of this model. Um, so most of the other half of the 30 residents in 1826 have bought property at the first sale in May 1823. Trustee Josiah Ramsey Jr. was named the first Jefferson City Postmaster in 1823. Robert Jones and William Jones were operating their tavern. McDaniel Doris had his distillery in full operation and his brother had set up his doctor's practice. Daniel Hogan had his general store open on what became Capitol Hill. Revolutionary War veteran Christopher Casey was serving as constable, and his son, Hardin Casey, who a blacksmith, opened the city's first grist mill at the northeast corner of Madison and High. Robert Ewing was practicing law, Jesse Royston was a teacher, and there was the rising sun. John C. Gordon opened the only inn when the more than 100 legislators and their staff arrived in 1826. It was conveniently across from the meeting house, but those who didn't get a room there had to either stay in a tent or find a room with the residents who were here. He had the only tavern license when the legislators arrived, though a few other people received tavern, license, tavern licenses later. The reason it was called the, the Rising Sun was the, the front entrance was decorated with a picture of the sun in its meridian splendor, rays glowing, points glittering, according to the State Journal. Now, there were a few entrepreneurs that arrived in between the Salem lots in 1823 and the arrival of the General Assembly in 1826. Hiram Miller, he was teaching school. Jefferson T. Rogers, who had served seven times as mayor, had a tannery and ferry landing at the north end of Harrison Street. So I bet he and Mr. Jones got along real well because they were both right here. George Woodward and Samuel Hart were merchants, and James Moss owned a grocery. And then there's Calvin Gunn. Calvin Gunn published the first newspaper in Jefferson City, June 14, 1826. The Jeffersonian was a five-column, four-page four weekly, filled mostly with state and national news. Coming from St. Charles, where he already established a working relationship with the General Assembly, the 28-year-old partnered with a 19-year-old, William Dunica from Coates Anderson, to open the newspaper office on Madison Street, across from the State House and next door to the Rising Sun. It was a one-story, two-room building equipped with two hand presses. Gunn built a temporary log home for his family at the south end of the block. When Danica left the operation two years later, Gunn renamed the newspaper in 1828 as the Jeffersonian Republican. 
Gunn held a monopoly on the city's news and the state's printing contracts for more than a decade. As you might have followed, a lot of the early Jefferson City's Sidians were transplants from Marion and from Coates and Ascend. Those who chose these two mid-Missouri settlements most often came from southern states, including Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And many were veterans or the family of those who served in the Revolutionary War or the War of 1812. In contrast to the veterans and southern pioneers, German-speaking immigrants were beginning to arrive in the city's first decade. The frugal do-it-yourself culture was in contrast to the ideal southern aristocracy held by some of the earlier residents. These contrasting cultures would work together to build the city, though some issues, especially emancipation, would divide them. Many of these pre-1840 German-speaking immigrants were craftsmen and had a hand in building the earliest state buildings. Matthias Wallendorf took the skills he learned from his father, Giuseppe, and built the first privy on Capitol Hill. He also built the fencing around the Capitol grounds. He owned a carpentry business and operated a sawmill in what is today the mill lot. Christopher Kolkmeyer laid the first stone for the 1837 Capitol. He and his brother Frederick were stonemasons from Hanover. They operated a quarry about where we are now and inserted their prosperous street and gutter work. Then there's Hanoverian Herman Tillman, who was a blacksmith and locksmith. He worked on the second capital and installed the locks on the first executive mansion. Tillman fought in, fought in the Prussian army at the Battle of Waterloo, and he also helped build the first St. Peter Church, putting up the Iron Cross on the wall building. Just for fun, it's interesting to note that there were an awful lot of Irish laborers and their families who lived in town during the construction of the second state house. The first five German-speaking immigrants to be naturalized in Polk County arrived as early as 1834 from Prussia. Before the city of Jefferson was incorporated in 1839, several German immigrants already had set up successful businesses, developing both the uptown area and what would become the mill bottom. Philip Magerly from Württemberg was a saddler by trade, opening a shop and a home at 118 East High Street. The Obermeyer brothers learned weaving and the merchant trade from their father in Bavaria, Simon, the first to immigrate, and Lewis operated the mercantile at the northeast corner of Madison and High Streets, while Joseph and Moritz made the caps which they sold. Perhaps the most successful of these earliest German immigrants was Gerhard Hermann Dooley, a Hanoverian teenager who arrived in Jefferson City in 1838. He worked in the brickyard and built a dairy farm, and then he took charge of the local mill in 1846. He built his own mill with the help of German-speaking partners in 1854 at the corner of Main and Walnut Street, establishing what would become the mill bottom. Over the years, other mills were built, making Jefferson City the hub for flour production for several decades. Dooley was instrumental in the early growth of St. Peter Church and also served the county as collector and sheriff. And then there's Charles and Christopher Mouse, who were teenagers when they moved to Jefferson City about 1839, under the care of their older sister Elizabeth, who had married Peter Miller. Eventually, four other brothers joined them here. Charles and Christopher learned the building trades, and while, Char while Charles served in the Mexican-American War, Christopher joined the 1849 Gold Rush to California. Charles and his brother-in-law, Charles Lowman, bought the east section of James Crump's Missouri House, built in 1839, and now one of the oldest standing structures in town. Charles Charles Mouse later built the Missouri Hotel across Jefferson Street, which he renamed the Union Hotel after serving in the Civil War. The Mouse family left Hesse to protect their father, a Lutheran minister. Charles became a charter member of today's Central United Church of Christ and donated the property on Monroe Street, where the Christian Science Church was built. These are simply a few examples of the merchant nature of early German-speaking immigrants to Jefferson City. By the 1840 census, Jefferson City was a year old, having incorporated in 1839. It had about 120 households, including the seven-year-old Missouri State Penitentiary, which listed seven inmates. Heads of households included the first mayor and the richest man in town, Thomas Lawson Price, and future mayors, Ferryman Jefferson T. Rogers, newspaper man Calvin Gunn, 
and Marion transplant Jason Harrison. Also living in Jefferson City at this time were brothers Meriwether Lewis Jefferson and Robert Randolph Jefferson, who claimed to be nephews of the president. In 1840, Meriwether married into another early pioneer family from Virginia, led by Gustavus Parsons. However, two years later, he was left a widower. Robert married Missouri Ewing, who was the infant when her mother, Jane Ramsey Ewing, painted the first town plat map for the May 1823 sale of lots. The 1840 census also included one free African-American household. Luke Ferguson was the only African-American listed on the census in Cole County. He had been enslaved by Callaway County resident Joshua Ferguson, who built the first Callaway County courthouse in 1826 in Fulton. When Joshua Ferguson died in 1834 at Coates Anderson, he freed Luke, along with two other men, Adam and Ned, a boy Bill, and a woman Sally. In exchange, Luke and Ned were required to cause Bill to talk, to cause Bill to be taught reading, writing, and arithmetic at their cost and expense. Now, as we have seen, Jefferson City was created from wilderness by chance, but dedicated veterans and entrepreneurs took advantage of the opportunity to establish the capital city. Southern pioneers and German-speaking immigrants together formed the early foundation that helped the city retain the capital throughout the next 